done yesterday. <coughs> we studied equivalence principle. So, what is the idea of equivalence principle? So, uh, if you are in a uniformly accelerating frame, or in other words, the acceleration per is equal to or is equivalent to the uniform gravitation field. Okay. So this was the crux of, or uh, this was the idea of the equivalence principle. Okay. And based on the equivalence principle, what we had arrived yesterday, that the light bends. Or in other words, uh, the gravitation bends the light. Or uh, uh, it means the photon is gravitating. Although it's massless, it's gravitating. Okay, we will see in a, I mean, in next lectures, what does that exactly mean? Eh? For the time being, we will simply remember there is actually a bending of light in a given gravitational field. That is what we have shown yesterday. Clear? Okay. So now let's take the other way around. Okay. So let's try to arrive at, uh, I mean, time gravitational time dilation. So let's arrive at this very concept, what exactly it means. Or uh, before doing this, okay, so let's uh, start, I mean, deriving the time dilation, okay, or, uh, uh, or uh, let's uh, do it this way. Let's check how the clocks are affected by the gravitation. Okay, we know from special theory of relativity uh, that there is a time dilation effect. When two inertial observers are moving, the time gets dilated. Okay, but that's a reciprocal effect. If you are hanging observer A, that sees observer B in motion, so their uh, observer A can measure that the time of the observer B gets slowed down, and vice versa. And observer B also sees the observer A in motion, and he looks at his clock that slows down. Is it? It's completely reciprocal effect. But we'll see actually in this gravitational field. Even though the clocks are at rest, uh, we'll see that this gravitation actually affects the rate at which clocks tick. Or in other words, the clocks slow down in a given gravitational field. They tick faster or they tick slower. Well, even though they are at rest. Okay. In other words, if you put two clocks in different gravitational field, they will show different times. Clear? Okay. So this will give you actually the idea of the aging. Yeah? Okay, so uh, before uh, I mean uh, going through this uh, derivation, let's take a thought experiment first. Huh? Okay, so let's consider a thought experiment. Let's take an elevator. Okay, so let me consider an elevator like this, huh? which is in free fall. Okay, so I am having this as an elevator, this is in free fall. Everybody got the idea what we are trying to do? We are looking actually at the effect of the gravitation on the clocks, okay? Or on the measurement of the time, clear? Or how the gravitation are affecting the clocks. Because yesterday, we have seen the gravitation is affecting actually the trajectory of the photon. It bends it. So, it may give us some clue that the clocks should tick differently in a gravity, given gravitational field. Okay, let's try to understand this kind of now. Okay, for that matter, I will consider a thought experiment. Okay, okay, I will consider an elevator. Okay, uh, that's in free fall. Let's assume I am having an observer E here, so that emits a radiation. Let's say he emits a light signal, clear? And there is a another observer. Let's call that observer as receiver. He receives what? The signal, clear? So let's consider. Uh, so I am having a signal that is uh, emitted by the emitter E and received by the R. So let's assume the height of this very elevator is H, okay? And the gravitational field is vertical. So that means I am having a free fall, okay? In a, uh, in a gravitational field which is parallel to our acceleration, clear? Got it? Okay, yesterday we have considered the gravitational field perpendicular to the Trajectory of the photon, is it? Yesterday we have seen this kind of, so you should get that idea again. So you all hang the gravitational field, let's say this way, okay? 
and you can stir actually the photon like this here. Clear? Okay, so uh, this was in the transverse direction, now we are hanging in the parallel direction. So this is our idea. Now let's take a look at, since I am in the free fall, or this elevator is in the free fall, okay? So what is, uh, uh, okay, so let's assume there is an observer, some kind of observer A, okay, in this elevator, and he observes this kind of phenomena. What he will observe in the free fall? There is no gravitational effect at all, clear? So that means, uh, whatever is emitted at E is received where? And so there will be no shift in the frequency because there is no effect of the acceleration, no effect of the gravitation. Clear? It's completely free. It is a it is a frame of reference. You can think it's an inertial frame without gravity. Clear? Got it? So that that means in this very case, no effect at all. <coughs> what does that mean? So in this case, let me let's say if omega r is the frequency received at r okay and omega e is frequency uh, emitted at e clear so it means the change in the frequency omega r minus omega e since i'm considering it as a free fall so let's consider this as a free fall okay so what that is so let's call that the, as delta omega so let me write it as ff minus free fall, so that's equal to zero. So there is no change in frequency for an observer who is observing uh, this free fall motion. Clear? Got it? So this is the first step. Yesterday we had actually three steps to process uh, the equivalence principle or to apply the equivalence, equivalence principle on a given problem. What were the three steps? You look. So you first uh, the first step was to consider the free fall motion is it uh, the observer who is attached with the free fall second you consider now an observer who is watching that free fall or an observer who is constrained uh, this i mean who is outside this kind of elevator clear so now let's go to the second step okay got it so let's move to the second step if you have any question here okay so let's move to the second point okay so now i am having observer let's say so you are having an observer B who is watching this elevator, the same elevator. So you are having emitter here, you are having a receiver here. Okay. Now what this observer? Okay. So a gravitational field is like this thing. It's under free fall. Hello. So now for this very observer who is who sits outside this very elevator, hello. So what he is observing? He is observing this elevator is accelerating downwards. Let's say I'm saying it's accelerating downwards. Clear? So there is an acceleration effect. So it means okay. So uh, the first uh, point is that suppose if this at t equal to zero when okay. So at t equal to zero, this emitter uh, sends a signal to the receiver. Clear? And it is received by the receiver at after some time because it will take some finite time. For a signal to reach from emitter to the receiver, although that will be very small, clear. If I consider it as a finite box, okay. Now, when this B observes this elevator, this elevator is under free fall, so that means there is a motion of both E and R, clear. Is that true? So, what he will see, this observer B will see this E approaching to R, okay. So, let's say at T equal to 0, he emits the signal, clear, but. Uh, as time goes on, he will move downwards. So it means this E, the first signal he has sent, it has moved towards R. Clear? Got it? So, much sure. so what will be the effect on the signal uh, this receiver receives? So there will be actually a frequency shift, the Doppler shift, is it? So the Doppler shift says when you are having a source moving towards the receiver, so what should happen to the frequency? It should increase. Clear? So this observer will see the signal which is received by this R is Doppler shifted but towards blue. I mean it will be increasing because the wave train will be compressed, compressed, clear? So frequency will increase, got it? So much more. 
So for this observer B, so there will be the first thing will be the Doppler shift. Doppler shift of frequencies. Since we are not considering the complete relativistic motion, we are considering it is going slowly. Okay? I mean V by C is smaller. V is the relative speed, it is small. So you take your relative to Doppler equation and put V by C is very less. So what you will do, so the change in frequency, okay, by Doppler, like this thing. So omega is the frequency that is emitted at where? E, clear? So uh, let me write it is like this thing. So it is omega R minus omega E divided by omega E. Okay, so that's actually equal to uh, some delta u by uh, c, kind of. Okay, where u is actually the relative velocity, you can see. Or the u is the velocity, or delta u is a small velocity with which this emitter moves towards r. Because when it is in the free form, this will see it is accelerating. Okay, when it is accelerating, there is a velocity involved. Clear? So this delta u, you can say. Okay, small okay velocity with which with which e moves towards what towards r. Got it? So is it clear? So uh, you agree upon that there will be a Doppler shift? Okay, so what is this Doppler shift? It will be towards why? Okay. So, because the free uh, source is moving towards the receiver, clear? So, in other words, I am having a blue Doppler shift. Okay? So, this is one of the observations who is making uh, the observer outside this very elevator that is in free fall, clear? Okay, now what equivalence principle says? Yesterday, we have the another statement. The physics in one frame of reference should be same as well. Physics in the another frame of reference, clear? So that is the equivalence principle what we have done. But here, okay, so in the free fall, when you are having an observer in the free fall, you observe no shift in the frequency, clear? But when you are having an observer who is watching outside this very elevator, what is looking? There is a change in frequency, okay? But I say by the equivalence principle, both results must be same. But it does not appear to be same here, clear? You are having a shift in one frame and no shift in the another frame. But equivalence principle says there, okay, either there should be the same, okay, the effect should be the same. Okay? So, in other words, there should be, by equivalence principle, there should be no uh, frequency change or there should be no shift in the frequency by the observer or the no frequency shift that is watched by the observer B. Clear? Okay? So now if you look at the problem carefully, we have taken only one point into account. That is only the acceleration which this observer B is watching. Since this B is watching this elevator under a free fall, so he, uh, there are actually two things, two effects that may, uh, that may arise here. One is an effect due to the acceleration, another is actually the gravitation which is pointing downwards. Clear? So this observer watched two effects. Actually, he has two things at hand. One is actually the gra gravitation, because this is a free fall under the gravitational field, and there is actually the acceleration. Clear? So that means, okay, so I have calculated the effect of the acceleration. Clear? So now, what it means? So it means there must arise a frequency shift due to gravity, which will cancel this blue Doppler shift. Okay? So, in other words, this frequency shift should be red shifted, okay, the, of the same amount. So, if you are having a blue shift and then you add a red shift uh, of the same amount, they will cancel. So, that the net result is zero, clear? And we have got the equivalence principle result. So, there is no change in the two frames, clear? So, so if I take now gravity into account, so, okay, so then the gravity must do a red shift of this very signal that is sent by emitter to the receiver. And that must be of the same amount with an opposite sign, I mean, so that it will cancel this uh, Doppler red shift, sorry, Doppler blue shift. Clear? Any question? Huh? 
Any question? Okay, so what we have got here? So I will calculate the, this ratio. What we have got? So this gravity influences the frequency. Is it? For the time being, we will say it influences the frequency. Clear? So if you see, what is the frequency actually? It is inverse of time. Or in other words, the unit of time is changing. The gravity is influencing the clock with which you measure a given frequency. So much now? Got the idea? Okay. So now let's calculate this uh, redshift. Okay. How to do it? Uh, okay. So I will use equivalence principle here. So I can consider, let's say, instead of considering this free fall, what I will do? I will consider uh, my, okay, so let me write this elevator. You are having E and receiver here. R. I will consider an elevator which is at rest in the field minus U. So it is in the rest in a gravitational field. Okay? Now I will consider another elevator which is being accelerated at A equal to G. So when you x okay, so I will consider another let's say elevator. In your hand, this is E and this is R. So this is accelerated. At how much? So at the same pace. So does equivalence principle apply here? Huh? Oh, yes. So you are having a gravitational field here. You are also having the same gravitational field here. Clear? Both the frames are equal then. Clear? So much now. Now when you are accelerating it, so what happens to this R? Actually, both emitter and R are in the motion. Clear? So much now. So if you look at the point third. Uh, we have to reproduce the or we have to apply now the special theory of relativity results. Clear? Like you said, uh, if the emitter will come towards the observer, huh. external observer. Huh. So no, I am not saying emitter is coming to the external observer. As it is descending downwards? No, no, I have not said that. What I am saying, so you are having a free fall. Okay, so in the previous case, you had this kind of free fall. Clear? So, E will move towards who? R. R, R. No, no, no. E will move toward. Okay, so it will be like this thing. So when you are having a free fall, it will be like this thing. Okay, so width of this box will be the same thing. So let's call it as a R prime. Call this as E prime. Okay, E prime R prime is same as E R. Okay, so the uh, it is observed by who? External. External observer. Okay. Now at the time at t equal to zero, uh, a signal is emitted. Is it? But this position is at the later time. Clear? So that means when this receiver uh, receives this very signal, in the meantime, what he is seeing? Shift of this emitter. Clear? So it is actually moving towards who? R. It, and this moment is seen by who? External observer. Okay? But it is not seen by the observer inside the free fall because he will observe nothing. Clear? So think, okay. So you drop a box. Okay, when I am looking at that very box, what I am seeing? Top is moving towards the bottom. Clear? Got it? All the box is fixed. Only the top is moving towards the bottom. Nothing more than that. Okay? So you have to consider because at t equal to 0, a signal is emitted. And it should be received by the what? Receiver. But in the meantime, what is happening to the uh, emitter? It is moving towards uh, the receiver itself. Okay? So much now? Okay, so what I was saying here. Okay, so now let's look at here what I am saying. So instead of now, I need to calculate what is the this red shift that is caused by the gravitational field. Let's try to calculate it. Okay. If you look at the second point, uh, okay, of our arguments. So what you have to do, you have to actually apply now the special theory of relativity because, okay. So these two observers are actually the same thing, identical. Okay. So you put a box so that is static at rest in the gravitational field. And you are accelerating another object of the same amount. But you are having the gravitational field. Okay. So that means these two observers are identical. In other words, I can 
treat them as the inertial frames of reference. Clear? So I should not use the inertia, but you can have that kind of concept here because the frames of reference are both same. Clear? Okay, so when okay, so when this moves, so there is actually the okay, uh, so both R and E are in the motion with respect to the E and R here in the gravitational field. Okay, now I can apply this special theory of relativity that if you observe, let's say a given frequency, there will occur now the Doppler shift again. Clear? Rather, there will be a change in the frequency due to this kind of relativist motion. Or I have to apply the Lorentz transformation on the frequencies what are being received by R and E, or what are okay, what are received by R in this accelerating frame. So much so when I am saying special theory of relativity applies here, it means I have to apply actually the Lorentz transformation on the frequencies involved. Okay, what is the frequency involved here? A received frequency and an emitted frequency. Clear? So if I apply now the Lorentz transformation, okay, so it says if you receive the frequency omega r. It's something frequency what is being emitted root of 1 minus v by s. Okay, so let's write it as uh, u delta u because we are considering actually the infinite symbol. Okay, this delta u, let's see. Okay, you got it? So much more. Now, if this, since the motion, uh, you can approximate it like this thing. So, can anyone tell me how I can approximate? Because this delta u by c is very small. Okay, I'm not considering any kind of latest motion. I'm considering a small, I mean, uh, it is moving with a small velocity here. And uh, what we are considering here, the infinite similarly small steps. Okay, in that sense, this delta u by c is very small. Okay, so I can simply write it as omega e into 1 minus delta u by C kind of thing. Approximately. Yeah? Clear? So approximately we can uh, write it this way. Uh, that means they are actually not accelerating, they are moving with certain velocity in the opposite directions. It is something, let's say, a person sits standing at some point, okay, in the gravitational field and you accelerate some object with the same gravitational field, what it means? So you are creating the same gravitational field, in that gravitational field you are having certain velocity. So for this very observer, that observer is moving with the river opposite velocity, clear? <coughs> Got it? So you are actually making the same gravitational field. Why the reason being that that is only when you can have these two observers to be identical. Okay, are uh, equivalent observers, not identical, I should say equivalent observers. Because the gravitation in one frame is same as the gravitation in the other frame. In that context, you can apply the special theory of relativity. Okay, now if you accelerate this, let's say A is not equal to G. Although it is accelerating, there is a gravitation. Okay, but by equivalence principle, then this observer is not same as this kind of observer. Because the gravitation here is different than the gravitation here. Is it? Any doubt? This is very important to understand. Eh? Okay, so what it gives me? Now it gives me, let's say, this omega r minus omega e divided by omega e. So that is same as actually delta omega by omega. Okay, so that's how much? Delta u by c. Okay, so this is our the red shift occurring due to the gravitation. Now, how much is it? Minus delta u by c. Clear? So, it will cancel with the blue shift. So, now, you can say the total net effect is what? Zero. So, there is no frequency change as observed by uh, the observer who is sitting outside the elevator. Clear? So, now you are having the equivalence between the two observers. Got it? Any problem? Okay. So, let's move to this idea, this gravitational redshift, okay? Okay, so what we are having, this delta omega by omega, 
okay so let me write it as a gravitational redshift is equal to minus delta u by c for the timing let's write it okay so let me put it then we can dis we'll discuss it okay uh, next i will discuss it what exactly it means eh? okay so uh, what is delta u it is the velocity with which this observer moves is it okay so let's say if you are hang um, uh, at as the height okay so let's say the h is the height of the elevator is it so it means so the bottom of the elevator is uh, maintained at some gravitational potential and the top of the gra it is maintained at the other potential is it so samajhe ma okay so uh, what i want to do i want to convert this velocity i want to write this velocity in terms of the gravitational potential samajhe so if you are hang a emitter here and receiver here the receiver is maintained at some gravitational potential then this although the observer this observatory is very small but still uh, there is a some sort of difference clear so much now what ultimately you are looking at if you look at this thing there is nothing like the gravitational potential coming is it you don't have any gravitational potential in this very formula but what i want to do i want to write this object this red shift in terms of the gravitational potential so that it is clear this is due to the gravity gravity clear samajh so, samajh how to write it can anyone tell me how i can write this delta u no uh, not energy can just a uh, simple formula yes how okay so what is the velocity it is acceleration into time simply so you can write this delta u as g delta t what delta t is the infinitesimal time over which this moves okay now what is the delta t can anyone tell me delta t is actually this h by c is it because we are considering this delta t amount of the time it takes the signal to reach from e to r okay so i can write this as g into h by c okay so now what is the gravitational potential no what is the gravitational potential how we define the potential uh, grav uh, okay acceleration due to gravity multiplied by height is it g into h so that means this g h i can write the gravitational potential divided by c so this is the gravitational potential okay got it so uh what i will write this phi phi will be actually uh since i have calculated this h h is the height of this very elevator clear so this phi will actually represent the difference between the potentials of emitter and the receiver clear so samajh aao okay so let me write it this way so i should put it instead of phi let me write it as a delta phi okay so so this gh okay so this delta phi is equal to gh okay so this, therefore i can write this as minus what it is delta phi by c square so this i can write as minus times 1 by c square what is delta phi it is the potential at the receiver minus potential at the okay so since this is a change in velocity okay so when you consider the change in velocity you have to take the final minus the initial kind of thing eh? final point is r eh? and the initial point is e that's why you are hang here what uh, final point is phi r and initial point is phi e clear okay you should not get confused so everybody has written it okay so r i can write it like this way okay so delta omega i can write what it is so it will be omega at the receiver minus omega at the emitter divided by omega e so that's equal to minus 1 by c square okay phi r minus phi e or in other words i can write this omega r is equal to omega e into 
1 minus phi r minus phi e by 6. Just take this thing, omega on that side, then okay. So take this omega there, it will be 1, okay, minus this object. Clear? So, now, so what it gives me? It gives me simply the change in frequency at receiver uh, is proportional to this kind of factor. Okay, in other words, the uh, at different kind of potentials, gravitational potentials, you uh, get the different uh, frequency shifts. Okay, due to this gravitation. Clear? Okay. Now the point is that so this has been confirmed by pound and ripka. Okay. So pound and ripka uh, performed this kind of experiment. Okay. So home assignment is so learn this pound and ripka experiment. It's a very nice experiment. Okay, just search in the Google. Okay, pound and Ripka experiment of determining this gravitational redshift. Okay, so so it is the home assignment and write a note on it. So I will check it. Hello? Any problem? Okay. So so it means what? Any a light ray that's emitted at okay different kinds of potentials. Let's say if it's emitted at the higher potential, it will be received with the smaller frequency. If it's emitted at the lower frequency, lower potential, it will be received with the higher frequency. Clear? It depending upon this kind of difference. Eh? Let's say if this is if emitter is larger, eh? so what it means? So this will be positive, it means it will be received with the what? A higher frequency. Clear? So if this is larger, receiver frequency is very large. So that means it's a negative, it will be uh, received with a low frequency, clear? So much you want? So that means different gravitational potentials give you the different shifts. Okay, so remember this kind of point. Okay, so now the point is here. So how we define the frequency? Let's analyze this kind of result. Okay, how we define the frequency? So let's try to analyze. So we have get we have got here actually the frequency shift, is it? So what frequency means? Frequency simply gives you the number of waves per unit time, clear? So let's say at the emitter you are having number of waves 10 uh, in some time interval. How many you should receive? Isn't, don't you see it is an absurd result? So let's say this is in the gravitational field, okay? So at the top, I am sending you tens, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, these crust, crusts, the, let's uh, identify the crusts as the, uh, with the frequency, okay? Number of crusts will give you the uh, frequency, okay? So uh, let's say number of waves, eh? so at certain time, I will send you the number of 10 waves per unit time, clear? So how many I should receive at the bottom? What I am getting here? I am not getting 10, is it? So when I am saying the frequency in the gravitation, this is not, this laboratory is not in the motion, okay? At the top of the building, I will send you the 10 waves per unit time, clear? Okay, so how many you should receive at the bottom? Again the 10, what is happening with this very formula? So at the first instant, it seems absurd, but it's not, okay? So Einstein argued this thing, the number of waves per unit time remains same. It's only the unit of time is changing in the gravitational field. When you change the unit of the time in the gravitational field, so the frequency will change, is it? But the number of waves will be always same. Samajha? So I am simply changing the unit. Okay, so since frequency is, okay, it's inversely proportional time, clear? If I change only the time unit, so my frequency will be uh, same. So let's say you are, um, it will adjust it in such a, let's say you emit 10 waves per unit times at the top, okay? At the bottom, uh, you will receive the same thing. It will be compressed or it will be expanded, but only the unit of time will change. It will adjust in such a way, you will receive the same amount of the waves, same number of the waves, but only the unit will change. So, much more. so let's say if I am sending you something from the top, okay, at the bottom you want to receive the same thing, but to have some effect on it, either that box should get, let's say send a box from the top to bottom, okay? So I want this box should get deformed. 
at the bottom okay but the box should remain same i mean what are the contents of the box it should remain same clear so what you have to do you deform it clear so that the contents of the box remain same got it it is happening here that means the, the units in which you measure the box get changed but the contents of that very box remain same identical clear so much more so that means this gravitational potential is or the gravitational field is influencing our time unit okay so let's try that okay so argument of the einstein so let's put okay the blocks at different the blocks are done at different rates huh? okay let's straight it okay so it's like different gravitation okay so we call this as the gravitational time dilation it is entirely different from the uh, time dilation that occurs due to lorentz transforms clear okay or uh, that occurs in special theory of relativity okay so let's we'll get in a moment what is it friends clear okay so i can write now the frequency so as 1 by d tau okay so where d tau is the uh proper time okay at the emitter let's say okay so you have to measure when you measure the frequency you have to be in the frame of reference of the signal clear okay when you have when you are in the frame of reference of the signal so it means you have uh, the frequency will be simply proportional to the proper time of that signal clear so that's why let's me write d tau huh? small time i am measuring it for a small time clear <laughs> so much over okay so yes Proper time is not changing. It is an invariant. So if the temporal component of the surface is changing, this matter. Why I have not considered any kind of matter. How? Yeah, we define this proper time in terms of matter. No, no, I have not defined any kind of matter. So we are not doing any geometry here. We are only doing equivalence principle. We are looking at what are the implications of the equivalence principle. I have not considered any kind of metric here. So when such is the temporal component? Is this Where is the temporal component? Okay, if time is Neither I am considering here space components nor I am considering the temporal components. We are founding our theory based on arguments. We are making simply the arguments. We are not going to the mathematical details of our theory. Sir, how do we say sir, which is changing? Which, which is changing? Change? Which is, is it hypothetical? No, it's uh, not hypothetical. So there is a difference between a proper time and the coordinate time. I will tell you in a moment. Okay. So let's write this uh, frequency as one by theta. So this is the proper time. It's not hypothetical. Okay. So now let's write our gravitation this dilation. Okay. so therefore i can write this omega r minus omega e by omega e so how much is that so let's write it so it will be simply 1 by d tau r minus 1 by d tau e divided by 1 by d tau e kind of thing so how much is that so let's evaluate it it is delta Like this thing, d tau r. Okay, so d tau will cancel with this thing. It will be d tau. Okay. So that has to be equal to how much? Anybody minus? You are having phi. What was the phi? What was the first thing? Phi receiver minus phi emitter divided by. Okay. So in other words, okay. So let me write instead of this e and r. 
So let's consider this point 1 where the signal is being emitted and let's consider the point 2 where the signal is received. Okay, so I will use that kind of notation now. Uh, instead of this R and E always, so let me put it in terms of 1 and 2. So I am having two observers. So one observer is sending a signal and another is receiving that kind of signal. Okay? So let's put it in that fashion. So what it gives me, what is this D tau E? So it is D tau 1 minus D tau 2 by D tau 3. Clear? So that's equal to minus phi 2 minus phi 1 by 6 square. So that's simply equal to phi 1 minus phi 2 by 3 square. Okay? So let's calculate now this D tau 1. Okay? Got it? So that means I want to calculate, I want to look at the clock that is where at position 1. So it means simply forget about now you are sending a signal or whatsoever. So you are putting a, you are having two clocks. One is where? One is at that, this gravitational potential, another is at this gravitational potential. So let's call the gravitational potential here phi 1 and the gravitational potential here is phi 2. Clear? Got it? So now let's calculate. What is the rate at which this clock ticks? Okay. Okay. So, or in other words, let's compare the two clocks. So, that's actually giving this kind of relation. Question, sir. Huh. Sir, which observer is observing? So, now look here. Uh, so, now uh, this is happening. Uh, okay. So, what do I have done? So, I, I got your confusion. So, first I want to listen from you. Okay, so yes, the point is that from that kind of observation while you are having elevator falling and that's being watched by the observer, he has got this kind of effect, one due to Doppler effect, another due to gravitational redshift, is it? Now let's, okay, so Einstein put forward an argument that the number of waves is same, only the time unit is changing, okay? So we will use this now argument, okay? So why it is happening? If you see this redshift, gravitational redshift is happening. So, in a kind of observatory where emitter and uh, this receiver, they are fixed. So, in other words, if you are, hang, are in this kind of room, you send a signal from top to bottom, you will get this kind of gravitational redshift. Although it is not observable effect here, uh, lab is very small. So, but you will observe that thing. Clear? So, no. so, for the observer that is inside it, you know? No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait a second. Now, we are forgetting the elevator business. Okay, now what I am trying to do, since my argument of the Einstein is that the clocks in the gravitational field uh, tick differently, clear? They show different times uh, in the uh, in different gravitational field, is it? Or they run differently? Got my point. Now what I am doing, I am putting one clock at some height, at some gravitational potential and another clock at the other gravitational potential. And I know actually the relation. The relation what I have got, the gravitational shift, is it? Red sh the gravitational redshift formula I know now, is it? From that what I am calculating, how the time of the two clocks, um, how I can match the time of the two clocks, okay? How they, I mean, how they read differently. You got my point? Now it has nothing to do with the elevator. Now you are having, you are yourself, okay. So let's say you are carrying your clock here at this gravitational potential, is it? And I am carrying my clock at this very gravitational potential. Okay, so now I want to compare the times of these two clocks, simply. So that will be given by this gravitational redshift formula, okay? Because by the equivalence principle, the acceleration is same as the gravitation, uniform gravity. Since we are looking locally in a small patch of the, let's say, in the huge gravitational field, the, acceler uh, the acceleration and the uniform gravitational field is same, clear? Samushama? So that means we have two observers here carrying out two clocks in this gravitational field. It is identical to the same thing what is happening with the elevator in the free form. Got the point? Huh? Okay, so now I am comparing the times of because uh, we have seen there is a gravitational redshift. It implies actually the rate of the clocks at which they show the time is different, is it? Or uh, they should be related. Okay, so let's get the relation. So this will give me actually the time, dt tau 1 will be the time shown by the clock maintained at the gravitational potential phi 1. And dt tau 2 will be the uh, time shown by the clock at gravitational 
where uh, in the gravitational potential phi 2. Got it? So let's calculate it first. Everybody got it? Okay. So it implies therefore this d t tau 1 is equal to 1 plus this phi 1 minus phi 2 by c square into d t tau 2. Okay, so you just take d t tau 2 on that side, then take this d t tau 2 again, so it will become d t tau 2, this multiplied by this. Clear? So now if my gravitational field is uniform at the both the points, phi 1 and phi 2, let's say they are the uniform, but they are different. Clear? So I can integrate this out. So it will be simply a constant. So it will be like this thing. So in other words, so I can write simply as this tau 1 as 1 plus phi 1 minus phi 2 by c square into tau. So what it means now? So this is very important result. Okay, now let's look at first the special theory of relativity result. There is also a time dilation, clear? So what that time dilation is that? One observer sees and uh, the, okay, observer A sees the observer B running slow and observer B sees observer A running slow. It is completely reciprocal, clear? But here what is happening? The observer A sees, okay, let's say observer B sees observer A to run faster and observer A sees observer B to run slower. It's not a reciprocal effect. Let's say, maintain at certain gravitational potential, your clock will, let's say, tick faster than the maintain at the lower gravitational potential. So, let's say if phi 1 is larger, so then, okay, let's say if this difference is positive, so that means, uh, which is a higher potential? Eh? If this difference is positive, which clock is at the higher potential? Huh? Which is at higher potential if this difference is positive? High one is maintained at the higher potential, okay? So what does that mean? Tau one is greater than actually it's tau one by tau two is actually greater than one. That means tau one is greater than tau two. What it means? The clock maintained at phi one is uh, moving faster, I mean, um, uh, it's ticking faster, okay, than the clock maintained at the phi 2 and the other way around. So, in other words, you are hanging in strong gravitational field, the clock will run very slow than in the low gravitational fields, clear? So, and the low gravitational field the clock will always see uh, the strong one moving slower than his clock, clear? So, it's not reciprocal. One is not, okay, let's say it's not like this thing. A is looking at B moving slower and B is moving, the A is going slower. It's not like that. A is always seeing B going slower and B is always seeing A is going faster. So, so it will simply depend upon what is the difference of the potentials. Okay, this is the main difference between the two things. Okay, so this is very uh, profound implication, this kind of thing. So, I will give an example. So, what he said. So, let's say, since I have, yes, any question? Okay. So let's assume you are having two observers. One observer is sitting at the horizon of the black hole. Let's say you are having a light ray come. Okay. That means in the strong gravitational field, when you are having a strong gravitational field, what will happen? The time there will be, uh, ma okay, huge gravitational time shift, is it? But, okay, so when the gravitational time dilation is very huge, what will happen? So the clock for that very object will run slower. When you measure it at a far up distance, what will happen? No, what will happen? So you are measuring now in your coordinates, okay? You are measuring the coordinate times. So that means that very object will take large amount of time to be received. Because when the time is getting larger, Okay, this gap is getting larger, you will take larger amount of time to receive that object, is it? So when the gravitational redshift is, let's say, infinite, so what does it mean? So in your coordinates, I am at the far-up distance, okay, let's say I am at a far-up distance, I am observing some star, clear? 
let's say the gravitational shift due to that very massive object is infinite what will happen so the light signal that is being emitted there it will never reach to me is it so in other words that very object will not allow in other words i can interpret that object does not allow uh, the light to leave is it so that's happening in the black holes clear so you have not uh, the signal does not leave what the black hole so much sure? so it does not cross the horizon of the black hole yes sir Huh. Yes, so this is one of the arguments. Okay, so but that is actually true. Uh, okay, so here you can uh, in this kind of uh, I mean on the earth, although you can say it is uh, climbing the hill, it is going against the gravitation, so it will slow down. Okay, so but there are actually other consequences for that. When it slows down, you can say it attains a mass. Okay, so but that is not true. Huh? So. Okay, so those arguments I will come to later on. Okay, everybody got it what we have done? Okay, so now let's do it in the other way around. So, here uh, this kind of formula we have observed as a free fall. Instead of doing the free fall, we will do it in the another way around. Let's try to do it in the another kind of derivation. Okay, because this kind of result, what we have obtained here, I wanted to cancel actually the blue sh Doppler blue shift, is it? Is it okay? But okay. So in a, okay, let's say our results are wrong. Let's try to do it in the another way around, and I should get actually the same result. If it is, if this result is true, there should be an another method to derive it. Clear? So let's do it in the another way around. Okay. Second way. Okay. So how much time? Okay. okay, so let's consider the elevator again. Okay, so let's think an elevator which is accelerating. Let's say it is accelerating upwards. Uh, with a is equal to g so that means i am mimicking the same gravitational field clear okay so you are hanging let's say you are hanging a here and you are hanging b here these are two observers let's say observer a and b clear so let's consider this as the z direction along which they are moving okay so uh, also so let's take the height of this very elevator to be h. Clear? So it's let's say it's moving upwards. Okay? With the acceleration a is equal to g. Okay. So um, in the first step, okay, I will consider two signals that is sent by a to b. Okay. Let's take first signal that is sent by a to b at t equal to 0. Okay, so in the first step. Okay, so let me take the first step. Okay, so at okay, so this is the situation I am considering. At t equal to zero, a sends signal to b. Clear? So it means uh, when a sends the signal to b, it will take some time to be received by the b. So it means at t equal to t one, b receives the signal. Clear? Okay. So <clears throat> let's take the another uh, signal that is sent by the same. Okay, so so you are having the same A and same B. So it is again it's accelerating. This is an observatory, it is going upward. First at t equal to zero, I will start at t equal to zero, and A sends signal to B. Clear? And after some time it is received by B. Now once the signal is received, let's say uh, a sends the another signal uh, to B. Clear? So let's take the another signal. Okay. Okay. So you are having signal sent by this. Uh, okay. Okay. Second step. Okay. Second signal. 
sent by A at what time? Can you tell me? So A first signal was sent by M by A at t equal to zero. Okay. So now A sends the second signal. So what is the time he will measure? His proper time. Is it? For his, the clock, the time which is shown by his own clock. Let's say at mm, delta t. So this is the amount of proper time shown by the clock with A. Is it? So much amount. So now it will take the finite amount of time to reach B. Is it how much time it takes the signal to reach B? It's T one. So now tell me at what time B will receive it? Okay. So B receives at what time? At some T is equal to. Can anyone tell me? T one plus the time shown by the clock at B. Clear? Because he will, uh, he has his own clock. He will say, let's say, delta T B. Clear? So we are taking proper times here. Right? Proper time shown by the clock at A. Proper time shown by the clock at B. That's why I have used this thing. Otherwise, you can say uh, T one plus some delta T A and so that. Right? Then I need to figure out what is the transformation between these times. Right? That's why I am using what only the proper time shown by the clocks. Clear? So is it clear? Now what I want to do in these things, I want to eliminate this T one. And okay, so now the proper time enters into the picture. I want to get a relation between this delta T A and delta T B. Is it? Okay. So since when the light falls in the gravitational field, what happens to that? It bends. Okay. So that means there is a well-defined trajectory. It will follow under the gravitational field. Clear? Okay. Instead of getting the trajectory of the signal, what I will do? I want to get the trajectory of this A and B. Okay. So can anyone tell me what is the trajectory of A and B? Since okay, so I am having A and B. Okay. So look at this pen. So you are having this A and this B. They are accelerating. Clear? So let's say at certain time, what is the coordinate of this uh, uh, bottom? G times T square. Is it? S is equal to half of G T square. Is it? What is the coordinate of this thing? It will be this height plus half of G T square. Is it? So much sure. So that will be that will give me the instantaneous position of these two observers. So much sure. So let's try it. So everybody got the idea what I am trying to do? Huh? Okay. So let's try the trajectory. Okay. Or the position. Okay. So let me write position. Of this thing, z b t. Since b is at the bottom, okay. So what is the position of this? So it is half of g t one square. Sorry, no g t one half of g t. Okay. So let's call this as first. What is the uh, trajectory? Okay, sorry. Instantaneous position of the observer a. So it is h because it is at a height of h first. Then you have to put. This is half a of this is second. Okay. Now let's apply uh, these two formulas on these two signals. So much, sure? Okay. So now let's calculate what is the distance between this A and B using these two formulas. So much, sure? So at what time? Say, okay. So let's take at t equal to zero. What is the distance traveled by the signal from A to B? So I know the instantaneous position of these two ob observers. So I can use let's say z a t equal to zero, z b t equal to zero. So much, sure? Okay. So let's try it. Okay. So first case in the first case that means the first elevator. So what is the distance traveled? What is the distance traveled? Let me write z a zero. Minus z b zero. Okay, I am uh, looking at t equal to zero because the signal is sent where at t equal to zero. So how much is that? So it will be simply equal to c into t one. Okay, so t one is the amount of time taken uh, by the signal to reach the observer b. Clear? So much now. Now tell me. So what it gives me? What is now z a zero? 
What is Z is? We have written Z is equal to H plus half of G G square. P is what? Now T1. Clear? Okay, sorry. T is, okay, T is equal to 0. So it will be simply H plus 0. Okay, it is from there. So minus what will be uh, ZB0? Zero? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. So distance will be actually. So because the signal is sent at where? T equal to 0. When it is received? So I have to, uh, it takes some time. So it is ZB T1. So what it will be? Half of G T1 square. So that is equal to T T1. So it implies H minus half of G T1 square. It is equal to C T1. Call this as the question. Okay. So I will finish this kind of, it is a small derivation. Okay. Just bear with me. Okay. So now let's take second case, second elevator. So what is the distance traveled again? So it is actually Z A tau, okay, B, okay, so let me write it as a tau A minus, okay, then, so let me write it properly. So it is something Z A delta tau a because the signal is released at that then z b p1 plus delta tau b clear Isha? so how much is the distance traveled the final minus the initial okay so it is equal to c into t1 plus delta t tau b minus c into delta tau b Isha? so this is the final point minus the Initial point, clear? So that I can write C into P1. Okay, so let's keep it as it. Okay, so now let's write the formula for ZA. So let's write for ZA. What is ZA? H plus half of GT square. So what is T here? Delta tau. Okay. So so I will use here. Okay, so using equation one and two. So also use equations 1 and 2. So what we will get? So what we will get? So it will be, tell me. So it will be something H plus half of G P, okay, sorry. What is that? Delta tau A whole square. Okay, then minus. So this is for Z A tau A. Then you are having half of GT, so it is T1 plus tau B whole square. Okay, it comes from ZB. So what is that equal to? So it is C T1 plus C delta tau B minus C delta tau B. Okay. So now assume since this delta tau is a small proper time, okay? because I am looking at the infinite simple amount of time clear so in other words we can ignore ignore higher powers ignore order of delta tau square because it's very small quantity so what i will do then when you say so it will be simply h okay so this i can ignore minus half of now g then you are having t1 square minus so it will be simply g delta tau b because you are having delta tau square here again that i have ignored there will be a term twice t1 delta tau b 2 and 2 gets cancelled okay clear huh? okay so that's equal to c t1 plus c delta tau b minus c delta tau b call this as 4 now subtract 4 from now i want to eliminate t1 Okay, let's eliminate T1 from where? Which equations? Uh, 3 and 4. Uh, we are almost done. Eh? Okay, eliminate T1 from equations 4 and 4. Okay, that means I will subtract 4 from 3rd. Okay, if you look at equation 3rd, that contains um, half of GT square, is it? Minus half of g to square, is it? 
So you look at the equation third. So that contains this gt square. Feel it? So that means this very term will cancel out. And that also contains h. Is that true? So that will also cancel out. What remains ultimately? So it will be like this thing. Shall I write result now directly? Shall I write? Okay. So it will be something g delta tau b p1. So that's equal to minus c delta tau b plus c delta tau b. Okay, so just rearrange. So I want, want to figure out this t1. t1 will be simply equal to c by g into delta tau a minus delta tau b minus 1. Okay, just to rearrange the terms, you get like this thing. So what I have got? P1. Now let's look at the elevator. What is the height of the elevator? Height of the elevator is h. So how much time it takes? P1 time. At the first instant, okay? So in other words, I can write h is equal to c p1. What it gives me? T1 is equal to h by c. Simple calculation. Because elevator does not change. It is of the same height, okay? So that means this is equal to h by c. Okay? So now calculate from these two things. You calculate now. This delta tau b is equal to delta tau a into 1 minus g h by c square. So what is g h? So it is the potential. Huh? So it is delta pi by c square. Okay. So that means the pulses which are, I mean, emit the rate at which the, so delta tau b will give me the uh, rate at which the pulses are received and delta tau a will give me the pulses, the rate at which the pulses are emitted, is it? Or the signals are emitted, okay? So it means this rate is changed by this much of factor. What is rate actually? That is the time, okay? So it signifies your gravitational time dilation and it does not, okay? So much ever? Since this gravitational time, here we have figured out this dilation arising actually in the accelerating frame of reference. Clear? So now by the equivalence principle, accelerating frame is same as the gravitational field. So that means this res result must hold for the gravitational effect. Okay? So in other words, gravitation dilates the time. So there is actually the gravitational time dilation. Okay? Any question? Wait a